Hello, guys. Uh, we wanted to start a session uh, on when network meets up. I think the title speaks for itself. It's really talking about the two worlds that were previously disconnected. Uh, my name is uh, Nati Shalom. I'm the CTO and founder, and I'm going to talk about mostly on the upside. And my name is Samuel Berkovic. I'm a product manager in Radware, and we specialize in load balancing and security networking equipment. So I represent the networking side. Let's move on. OK. So from the agenda today, what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about, uh, give uh, the background about uh, networking and application, um, present a specific way on how we see things are ha happening today, and then we'll talk about uh, what changed, uh, why all the, this pattern of uh, managing networks as a silo and application as a silo is going to be changing, and then uh, Nati will demonstrate how this actually goes into uh, work. Um, and then if we have time, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, additional things that are do being done. OK. So basic definitions, um, I'll be talking about the combination of deploying applications and networking. Um, obviously, as application people or people who manage applications, when we look at the application, um, Many of us will first look and see what are the application tiers, right? So this is a logical construct. Probably most of the application people um, are familiar with that. The next thing is basically to construct what are the building uh, servers, whether they are physical, logical, or uh, physical or virtual. Um, and then what's the plurality of them in this uh, topology? And then if we zoom into a specific tier, into a specific server, um, how this is constructed, what are the requirements, um, and the first time we will meet the network is basically by specifying how many network cards we need or how many connect, uh, VNICs we need, uh, what are the required type of IPs, um, what is the application frameworks that needs to be deployed, uh, whether it's a database, et cetera, and what port and protocol, and ov uh, obviously the application logic, the schema or in the database. Um, and all of this is pretty familiar, um, at least to me when I was handling applications. Uh, this is what I would be designing and doing day to day. Then the next thing to think about is the logical connectivity, obviously. If we have tiers, then how they get connected from a logical perspective, and that's usually obviously quite obvious. And in that case, usually this is where I would be done, right? This is where I would be thinking about IPs, connectivities, uh, how things are communicating point to point, OK? And the question is, well, where is the network? What, where, what are the additional things that are happening, either due to the application requirements or due to other concerns? So let's walk over that. So the, one of the first things that, as, an, as a network designer I'm usually doing is, understanding two things, whether there's any need for isolation due to security or things like this, or are there any specific requirements from the application side, things like multicast requirements or broadcast requirements. And that will usually lead me to the design of the broadcast domain, of which nodes need to be on which broadcast, right? So we, for example, we can have a DMZ zone with its own broadcast domain and a backend zone with its own broadcast domain. We could also decide to split it three ways, um, if that makes sense for any reason, right? Now, the minute that we got to that decision, or the networking guys have got to this decision, the next thing that they will do is there's the definition of the layer three, of the connectivity, IP connectivity, which is subnets. How do you reach out of the subnet gateways? The, how you manage IPs, the IP address management, and what would be providing the DNS services, right? And this is, again, something that as when I was an application, um, an application owner, didn't care about this, right? Well, the only thing that I cared is that I'm going to have my IPs and that everything communicates. But all of this is going underneath it, right? Then we are bringing in another, another concerns, maybe availability. Um, and this is maybe slightly unusual to use a load balancer for availability. But what would be more interesting is availability and scalability where we actually design how the application is going to be 
scale or, uh, or be available using load balancing technologies or such, okay? And again, that's something that um, on many occasions the network admin will design for us. And then security requirements, right? Firewall in different places, et cetera. And again, as an application user, most of these are like Chinese to me, right? Those are happening underneath the plane. Okay. Last thing is, this needs to be managed, right? So there's a third networking requirement, which is might be a new broadcast domain with its own subnets, with its own tools, and maybe this also needs to be connected to the outside world via VPN. So the key here is to understand that as an application in a standard environment, I'm really not aware on all the other networking moving parts. And from that aspect, there's very a uh, distinct delegation of responsibility, right? The, we have the network or security manager who will manage the broadcast domains, the connectivity, uh, all the network services, whether they are placement and configuration and the network security. And then the application itself, which is the server operating system and all the other stacks, okay? The only strange beast in this environment might be a load balancer because realistically speaking, it is a networking um, appliance connected to the network, but it, has, it might have a lot of application-based logic, right? It might have things like cookie stickiness-based, uh, layer seven routing policies, and other application-based logic. And in that regard, it is really a question of what's the right delegation of responsibility there, whether it's uh, the networking manager that does all of this, or whether that's the application owner that needs to understand what's, what to do in the load balancer, Usually in the standard uh, IT organization, the network manager will usually handle the load balancer as a whole, okay? So, so far, what, we under what we've seen is that you have the application owner managing basically the servers, stack, application code, and care about basic connectivity, and the networking admin who manages everything below that in about the networking concerns, security, et cetera. So what's changed? Why is it, why, do, why we believe that all of this is gonna be changed? Anyone have an idea? <laughs> hmm? Right, it's even more than that. What's changed is that everything has become an API. Everything become programmatically, and now you can orchestrate the delivery of all those things using a single way. Okay? And in OpenStack specifically, all those capabilities are actually exposed via the Neutron API. Things like layer two broadcast domain, you can create them on your whim if, if this is how uh, you're allowed to. You can create layer three subnets. You can specify how the IP addresses are being handled there. All the other services such as routers, gateways, NATs. Uh, you can actually manage also port security, which is more like a server-based security, but you can do port security. And obviously now you can also control the layer four to seven services, such as load balancing, VPN and VIP firewall. And all of this has concrete APIs that could be software driven, right? Yeah, and I think that uh, now that Shmuel explained uh, what is the network or where is the network uh, in all of our application, I think that one thing that was clear uh, even to me while working on those slides, is that there is a lot of networking out there that we usually as an application guys don't really care about or don't deal with, and mostly they are done statically, like someone configure or pre-configure them for us somewhere, even in the cloud world. Like we don't necessarily create VLANs on the fly when you don't necessarily, and we don't usually create public IPs and floating IPs uh, that often. Um, and we, we kind of uh, uh, work differently in the public cloud, but still it's relatively uh, static to what we have today. And, and as uh, Shmuel mentioned, the real potential here to really change the world we live in in terms of application deployment is that now we can merge the two. It's very similar to what happened in DevOps. Remember, previously to that, we have application owners and we have operational guys that are dealing with the management of the application itself. And the two didn't really connect, and there was a lot of siloism built into that process just because of that organizational barrier. And all of a sudden, cloud came in, 
and now developers have direct access to the infrastructure, which means that they can bypass the operations and do their own stuff. The same thing is going to happen here. And the fact that we have access to the API would also drive a lot of change in culture and the way we do things. And we'll talk more about it towards the end of that presentation. Now, to actually make it real, rather than a philosophical discussion, we're going to run two types of examples, uh, both doing the same thing. One of them is based on a specification that is called Tosca, and the other one is based on uh, OpenStack Heat. How many people are familiar here with the Heat? Raise the hand. OK. And how many people are familiar with Tosca? Good. So I'll just say a few words on Tosca and then uh, less on Heat, because it looks like most of you are familiar with that. I would say at the beginning, both of them are a descriptive language uh, in which you write a blueprint in some sort of a DSL, programmatic DSL, and then you could tell an orchestration engine to take that DSL and execute your deployment. In our specific case, the DSL will include both the application specification the and the network specification that maps to the Neutron calls and so forth. Uh, the difference between the two is that in the Tosca world, uh, this was actually built in a way that is un not specific to OpenStack. So it was actually built in a pre-OpenStack world. And it was built to provide a standard blueprint that will fit into many environments, not just OpenStack. And it takes, uh, if you would like, a more uh, top-down approach towards the problem, starting from the application, the dependency of the application. So there is a lot of that thought on how we orchestrate application and manage the dependencies and all the nodes associated with that. Uh, where Heat came uh, mostly as the equivalent of CloudFormation, the Amazon CloudFormation, uh, trying to map the existing, if you like, model that Nova have and all the different services within OpenStack have into a descriptive language. And then it grows up the stack uh, 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 from that point onwards. And now what we can see is also, uh, and, and I'll talk more about it, a kind of a merge between the two models, and I'll talk a little bit about that. That's why I wanted to show the two separate examples. On the example side, uh, I'm going to run uh, a typical deployment uh, of, uh, uh, that you'll see a lot in examples. Uh, we actually taken the Heat WordPress example and added networking piece into that. So that's kind of a, the standard t uh, WordPress example that you'll find over the web. Uh, plus networking attached to that. That's kind of, I would say, the heat version of the example that I'm going to show right now. And what you can see is the networking element attached to each of the nodes. So even though we're talking about two nodes, you can see that there is quite a amount of networking elements built into that. And that's kind of a typical deployment. It's not something rare. It's something that most of us do. It, we just don't think about it in that way. Or we're not doing it in an auto automated fashion. So for example, in a database, side, uh, we have a VLAN specifically that talks to the web container, the WordPress container. Uh, we don't want that uh, network to be open to the public network, so we created a separate network for that. Uh, obviously, we have a, a, a sub-network for that and a port that will allow the two to connect and a setup of a security group, which you like. It's a host-level uh, uh, firewall. Um, on the up, up server, the Apache server, uh, which is facing the world, uh, you can see that we have additional more components. And the additional components is because we need not just to connect between the web container and database, is because we need to connect to the outside world. Therefore, we have things like router uh, and uh, things that are related really to floating IP, uh, which means that we need to connect to a public DNS. And uh, the IP address that we're using needs to be accessible over the internet. And that's why we need to have that uh, available to us. This would be the, uh, the topology view. So when I run that, uh, I'll actually show that on, on the heat side. When I deploy it with heat, uh, that's the outcome of that. Uh, we'll see that in a second. But what we can see is the two side of networks that we have here, the application network and the database network. And you can see that the application network has a leg to the public router. Uh, and that's why we have those two separate networks. Uh, so with that, I'll jump into the uh, heat uh, reference here and the live example. Uh, obviously, uh, for the sake of time, what I did is I actually uh, ran uh, heat on DevStack on one of the uh, machines. Let me just set it up.
Okay, so what we can see here is a deployment uh, that I did on DevStack, and I already logged into the uh, DevStack uh, uh, Horizon console. Uh, I took the uh, WordPress blueprint that I think I referred to uh, earlier on, and uh, I uh, basically uh, used the command line or the, uh, uh, the online version of the command line to actually deploy the application, uh, the WordPress application. Uh, what we can see here is the networking elements, because of resolution, you wouldn't see the entire screen, uh, which basically shows all the nodes uh, that I described in the deployment itself. And let's see how the resources uh, looks like and how many resources do we have here. So obviously we have the network resource for the data uh, subnet, the WordPress Apache instance, the MySQL instance, and I wouldn't go through all of them, but basically for each element in the graph, we create an element in the DSL itself, and then we create the connectivity between them using uh, references, get parameters, and some other stuff that a uh, heat model uses. So the way I express relationship, if you'd like, in a heat template is that I'm using a get parameter from another resource, and that get injected into another resource and create a dependency graph. Uh, the lines that you could see on that graph is actually representing in the topology not the actual network connectivity, but the dependencies in the graph. So for example, when I'm doing a get parameter from a node that creates a dependency, that creates a line in that graph. That's kind of the way it looks like. But the important thing is that I was able to take a description, put it in one document, and in one click create both the network setup and the application setup and connect all of them together. That's kind of, I think, the important thing that I wanted to demonstrate here, and that can be done with HIT even today. The second example is uh, based on Tosca. Let me switch back to the slides. And what we'll see is a similar example. Oh, before that, let's see the, uh, how the blueprint looks like. Uh, so what you could see in the uh, blueprint itself, where did I put the laser thing? Did I throw it somewhere? Never mind. So what you can see here is uh, the following thing. We can see that we have, uh, and I actually took a snippet of the DSL and, and focused on the network elements in the heat DSL. Uh, what we can see is that we have here, uh, for example, the definition of the network itself, and the tenant ID of that network. Then we can see the subnet, which is the actual network, and the definition of the public DNS. Uh, so this would be the network that talks to the internet. And in that case, we are connected to public DNSs that will give us uh, the public IPs and the allocation pools uh, that is a result of that. Then we can see the actual ports uh, that each of the nodes will be connected to and how we're uh, basically using the get parameters to get references from those uh, network elements and network nodes into our existing nodes. So that's how a DSL would look like. Obviously, it's a little bit longer, but I think you get the idea. The second example would be a Tosca-like example. The reason why I'm saying Tosca-like is because Tosca itself is still evolving. Both Heat and Tosca is still evolving. Uh, so I took, uh, obviously, a snippet plus some extension that we've done. I'm going to use Cloudify, which is the engine or the implementation of that Tosca uh, uh, deployment. And I'll use that as the tool to actually drive the example itself. So similar to the previous example, we have the same uh, network elements plus the addition of an additional uh, monitoring and logging uh, network. Uh, so that's kind of just to make things more interesting. Uh, Cloudify uses that uh, as a default. Uh, again, just to make things more interesting, I'm not using the same WordPress example, but a very similar example using MongoDB as a database and, and Node.js as a front end. And we have the same kind of router setup. And if we really look at the uh, network topology, uh, in this case, I'm actually running on the HP OpenStack Cloud. Um, and I took a snippet of that. I'll show you how that looks like. What we can see is, again, the admin network and the application network, similar to the previous example, plus the administration network. And we can see that uh, there is a connection uh, to the router, similar to the previous example that we have here. Uh, the, so, so the other thing that I added here is another node that is the management uh, node that basically listens to everything that uh, goes here. And you can see that it actually plugs to all the uh, network uh, elements, and it will uh, do the logging and monitoring on that. And if we look at uh, the topology view of that, and I'll show you how that looks like live, we'll see a screen like that. So let me show you that live. Obviously, I already deployed the application. Uh, there's a 
that didn't want to spend a few minutes just to see circles turn it around. Uh, what I'm going to start with is uh, the deployment itself. No, very much. Oh, okay. I didn't know that it forgets the uh, display setup. Okay, so what we can see here is uh, the topology view uh, that is a result of the fact that I took a Tosca-based YAML. Let's see how that YAML would look like. Looks something like this. Okay, so basically uh, looks very similar to the heat one uh, with uh, several differences that I'm going to spend some time on. Uh, the interesting thing is that I can see all the elements, the host itself, uh, the database, and you'll see the networking piece associated with that and the relationship. I have a slide on that, so I'll zoom into that. But what I'm going to use here is a topology view because it's more, uh, it's easily uh, to look into that. And what we can see is that there is uh, a reference between a node and a relationship between that node that is contained within a certain host. So one of the things that Tosca is taking from an application-centric view is a relationship, for example. Then we have other things that describe policies and other things that describe alerts and all other things that currently in HIT uh, are not descriptive enough, if you would like. Yeah, there are ways to do that, but they're not descriptive enough. So in this case, for example, I could say that the Node.js node needs to live within the Node.js VMs, and it is connected to uh, a MongoD node, which is uh, uh, hosted in a MongoD uh, VM. And I can describe also the software components relationship at that level of granularity. Okay, so what we can see already is the differences between HIT and Tosca, at least right now, is that Tosca tried to provide more granularity on how we define the software components and how they relate to the network components, versus in HIT, it's mostly coming from the infrastructure view where we define the, uh, uh, the, the nodes in the system, and the dependencies and the connectivity uh, kind of uh, becomes an after effect, if you like, uh, of the fact that I actually did a get parameters from one node to another that created the relationship. Okay, so let's see how the actual deployment looks like in uh, Horizon. This would be a, a set of machines that I described. I think I showed you that. And we can see uh, later on uh, the list of uh, nodes here. So if I go to the deployment uh, view, so the first view that I showed is the actual blueprint itself. So I loaded the metadata of the blueprint. There was no real execution behind it, and I can create different deployments out of that definition. I could create deployment one, deployment two, deployment three, or whatever. That's kind of a cloudified uh, way of doing things. And the second view is the actual deployment. So right now, what I'm monitoring is I'm using the same modeling and mapping it to the physical devices and the state of those devices. I can see graphically very easily what is the state of the actual VM that is running, uh, what is the actual state of the component that is running, and what is the state of the connection between those nodes, and so forth and so forth. That's kind of the, give you the idea of the mapping between a model and that, and because in Tosca I can define that level of granularity, it's much easier to actually see those views up to the software components level uh, uh, at the very granular level. Let's go back to the slides and see how, uh, take a, a more closer snippet into the actual DSL. Okay. So in a Tosca-like example, the DSL would look something like that. You could see that it's more descriptive a little bit because, of, because the language is more explicit in terms of relationship and so. And you could see that, for example, uh, I wouldn't go through the entire components, but I have for each element, it's called a node, and I have a name for it and a type for it, and I can define different uh, level of types. But there is something that is called relationship, and the relationship could be contained in, for example, in the case of the neutral network, it could, be, uh, uh, the, uh, it could be another relationship, which could be, in this case, a dual relationship, uh, which could be contained in and depends on. So depends on would mean I, I wouldn't start that node or that element before that other node starts. And then I'll be connected in. So I can define several levels of relationship per node in this case. And as I said, it's a little bit more descriptive in that level of granularity and the result is that it's also more readable and uh, easier to parse. So back to Shmuel. 
Okay, so what we've seen so far is although there are two types of capabilities, managing and driving the network via software and also deploying the application, now obviously there's some uh, more nice use cases that we can programmatically address. And one of the more spoken about are uh, how you actually add the notions of auto-scaling and availability into this. And um, as an example, the idea is that when you deploy your uh, heat hot template or Tosca, the idea is that you also include uh, policies around the uh, existence of a load balancer and how it would behave. So when the application gets deployed, a VIP gets provisioned. Um, and since you actually want this application to be highly available, you can use uh, um, a load balancing solution that provides high availability and uh, isolation for the tenant. Um, based on the provisioning of such highly available load balancing solution, um, the load balancer gets provisioned and configured. Um, and then uh, using uh, scalability policies that can measure the performance of the application or other KPIs such as CPU, uh, the policy could either add VMs while programming the load balancer or remove VMs while also uh, programming the load balancer. And HEAT actually has such a, very graciously has such a nice example. Um, what, is, uh, what is available in this example is that if you can, whoop. If you, uh, if you can see, the idea is that um, you have the top level items that actually define the policy. They define which object is going to be uh, elastically measured, how to measure it up, how to add things up, when, how to scale down, and what are the KPIs. And then it also has the definition of the load balancer, such as the monitor, poor, et cetera. And all of this leads to not just being able to deploy an application, but also uh, to continuously measure how it performs and then scale it. Um, so, <clears throat> so far, so good. So we see that we have systems that enable you as, an end, uh, as, a, as a programmer, as an application owner, not just to own your uh, application stack, but also own all the uh, available uh, requirements from the network. But this actually might open to some more um, discussions. Yeah, so if you really consider uh, more real life scenarios, things that you would need to deal in terms of concrete use cases that are actually very popular, it's the continuous availability, for example. In that case, you need to worry about availability zones, for example, and making sure that nodes are not running on the same availability zones or region, which is also a network function, if you would like. And how do you do that, and how do you map that into a DSL in an autom automated fashion? Uh, you need to make sure that if we have a database and it's connected to a storage or a block storage, that block storage would be running in the same availability zones as my application, because uh, something that I don't want to happen is that the block storage would be in other availability zones and my application would be in another availability zone. So how do I create and map those more sophisticated relationship, if you like? Uh, the same goes with continuous deployment. That system is now up and running, and yes, I can, and we've shown it. Today, I can easily create that environment and automate both the networking and the application piece. How do I actually maintain it? Maintain it in the sense that I need to do upgrades, monitoring of those upgrades, uh, increase the capacity of that environment, and so forth. So this is the real world kind of uh, things that we need to worry about. And just to give you an idea of a real life example, actually, that was presented here in, uh, in the OpenStack Summit, an example of uh, the uh, HP print example. Uh, so what you can see is some of the numbers of the use case, and those are real. So they were actually coming from an Amazon deployment. They were using Chef and transitioned to uh, the OpenStack uh, on HP uh, public cloud-based uh, environment. Um, so kind of the, 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 the process that we've gone through in that process using the, the Cloudify product to actually map that uh, deployment that they have in Amazon into that included plugging into the Neutron API and creating all those uh, nice network setup, and also plugging into the Chef deployments and the existing artifacts so that they wouldn't need to change a lot of things when they do that transition. And the result looks something like this. Okay, so you could see that real life examples uh, would map, and this is actually taken from a real life uh, snapshots of their environment, so we could see a lot of network elements being created in their environment to be managed in that. 
And we can actually use the same techniques that I showed on the example earlier, not just for examples, but to deploy real life, more complex kind of deployment. So it's real. It's not something, it's not artificial, it's not a demo, it's not something futuristic, it's something real that can be applied today to application today, and that's kind of the, the reason why I, I pointed to that. Now, if we really look at the future work, this is the thing that I'm working on. <laughs> this is my dream world. Uh, but I'm not going to talk to you about that right now, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of things that are uh, taking place. Uh, and actually, this summit was, uh, this, those type of topics was uh, fairly hot in this discussion. Uh, by the way, there would be references on the slides for both the demos, so you could download the demos and run it yourself, both the he demo and the Cloudify demos, so don't worry about the references. Uh, there is an there is a ongoing project, which is the Tosca project, uh, Tosca processor project, as it is called, uh, which transform uh, a Tosca-based uh, uh, DSL into HIT. I'll give you the reference to that. That's one aspect to get HIT and Tosca closer together so that we can benefit from both worlds. HIT as the infrastructure modeling and, uh, and uh, Tosca as the application modeling uh, language. Uh, the second work uh, that is done is within HIT so that we can create a transformation into that Tosca, from Tosca into HIT. There are certain capabilities uh, like the ability to run actions, dependencies, and so forth that was missing, and HIT is adding it to its own hot uh, specification. And in that case, that means that from a feature set perspective, it would be easier to map a Tosca model into HIT. So Tosca would be, if you would like, the, the portable version of a modeling that can plug into HIT. In that case, we can benefit from both worlds. Uh, the last point is that within Cloudify, the, the version that I showed here uh, was running actually with our orchestration engine. And the work that we're doing, and actually uh, there's a lot of discussion that we're having, and I'll be uh, more than happy to hear a lot of views or the views of, from you, is ready to run all that example directly on HIT. So in that case, Cloudify could provide all the monitoring and nice GUI around HIT and give you that full experience uh, with the logging and log stash and Elasticsearch behind the scenes, and it would still use the same HIT engine and the same HIT templates and connect to it directly as part of the deployment. That's something that we're uh, planning to do for the next release. On the area of networking, one of the, I think, one of the more interesting works that is currently happening, um, and to me it's quite promising, is group-based policies, which to me addresses two key things. It first enables the application user to actually express their requirement in a more high-level way than just specifying things like broadcast domains and layer three, which on many cases doesn't make sense in the dialect, and on other uh, area, allow the network admins to actually specify their uh, policies and requirements in a way that when you actually deploy eventually the solution, you get both the expertise of the networking on how it needs to be secured, how it needs to be efficient with the requirement of the application. And this is obviously a work in progress. It started from the Open Daylight project um, and it also has now an API that is work in progress in the Neutron uh, project. And I suggest that you uh, look at it because it might be, again, something that changes the way we operate. Yeah, and I think uh, with that, we kind of uh, open. Uh, wanted to open the, uh, the discussion for questions. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is a list of references for the examples. Uh, watch out for the get Cloudify hashtag or OpenStack hashtag. I'll be publishing the actual reference to those slides a few minutes after the session ends. So let's see if there are any questions from the audience. Was everything clear? <laughs> OK. So I see you are nodding. Uh, do you have a question or not? Or do you want to be the first one to ask questions? Nothing. Yeah, yes. yes. Uh, if you can go to the mic uh, so that others will hear that. I just had a question about rolling this out organizationally and if you had any tips for sort of helping people adopt change. And obviously, this can be a radical change for some people. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take that? this one. Yes. So I've seen uh, organizations that uh, although automation can take place, they don't really allow application users to manage the network and network people to do stuff for the application. It's still 
Uh, you still get the delegation of responsibility. You just use the API to accelerate the way you provision or you give you give uh, you you create the artifacts for the service. So, from a process perspective, it's still using the very similar process where people might be using via phone or with ticketing systems, but the frequency of how both of how both organizations could deliver their requirement or their artifacts becomes much faster. So, this is uh, one way to address the. Um, this one, this this change. Does that answer your question? Okay. And, and I think if I would add to that, it's very similar to the experience that we have with DevOps, right? Uh, it's a culture change and and so forth. And the lessons from that experience was that one, it's inevitable. Uh, if you want to really get to that level of agility, it will happen. You know, regardless if you want it or not, it will happen. Once developer have access to an API, they will use it, and they will try to bypass uh, barriers. And there there is no much weight that you could put borders for a long time and say, you know, here's your API, but you're not allowed to use it. Practically speaking, it will break at some point and sooner than you think. Uh, so the right way to deal with that is embrace the change and uh, accept the change. And I think we have experience with DevOps on how to do that by, for example, having the networking team, the networking knowledge as part of the application team, uh, things on that line that will make the, the two work together in a way that wouldn't replace the other because still, a lot of that knowledge of how to set up network is important, and not all people, not all developers would now have that, even though they have access to the API. Uh, so I think we can apply the same kind of lessons from the DevOps world on how we change the operational model and how we do things into the networking world, and, and that's another group that is now becoming part of that change. Uh, that was an excellent question, by the way. Any other question? So thank you very much.